Uh, my approach is going to be slightly different and deal with one of the common quandaries we have in medicine today, which is what do you do when you've got a terrible chronic disease that you're working really hard to find a cure, but you don't have one quite yet? How do you approach that? And so uh, I've decided to change my title a little bit to what you see up there, which says Dementia Care Works, the main message being that in dementia and Alzheimer's dementia specifically, um, there are lots of estimates about when we're going to see a cure, but there's really a lot that can be done to change the lives of patients and family members with what we know now. So this uh, figure gives you a sense of counts. You could get percentages, but they aren't terribly helpful to get a sense of counts because ultimately when we provide care, when we're estimating the burden of a disease, we need to know how many people we're going to be taking care of. And this illustrates dramatically how the counts of people with Alzheimer's and other dementias is going to grow. Starting in 2010, it's projected to double every 20 years, simply because the population is aging on a worldwide basis. So the number in 2010 was around 35 million. It's going to hit 70 and then well over 100 million uh, by the time we reach 2050, which isn't that far away, if you think about it. And then, of course, the question becomes, when will we have a cure? So there obviously is a lot of effort ongoing in this direction. Uh, the dis disappointing part is that in the last decade or so, approximately 95 clinical trials have failed to produce an effective uh, curative type therapy for Alzheimer's. Now, we always learn, even from such failures, and there is evidence that these new therapies that are in the pipeline might come onto the market. So it's always worth a consideration of what are they likely to do and how might their presence change the equation that we were just talking about. So what's in the pipeline that might hit in the market in the next three to five, maybe 10 years, for the most part are drugs that impact on the production and accumulation of a brain protein called amyloid or A-beta that's uh, involved in the um, damage to the brain that leads to the Alzheimer's symptoms. Pretty much every one of those drugs um, that are in the pipeline don't have good evidence that they're going to stop the disease in its tracks. For the most part, they're going to change its trajectory, bend its curve, if you will, in a positive direction. So in fact, what might that mean is that if they make it onto the market, the numbers that I gave you will be underestimates because we will be changing the curve, not stopping the disease, and therefore extending the life of people. And the uncertainty, of course, will be at what stage are we going to do that, and how are we going to impact the period of disability, which we expect people will still have. Will we make it take longer and be milder? So the good news is there will be a cure at some point, but in the next few decades, we're not likely to see a cure that stops the disease. So if anything, we'll be looking after more people with dementia than we've estimated. Now, from a large population study that we did in Utah quite a while back, the Cache County study, we were able to look at the trajectories of people with dementia in a systematic way in many hundreds of people. And this slide, I think, illustrates for you that there's a lot of variability in how people progress with dementia. We have individuals here who, even after half a decade, really don't change very much. And then we have people, a minority, who get worse very, very fast. And then intermediate groups, perhaps with slow progression at first, and then acceleration, and a number of patterns in between. So one of the interesting questions is, uh, has been for developing treatments now is to understand what are the variables that influence these changes in trajectory. How could we, for example, find out what variables make you go like this or like that as opposed to like that? And can we do more of that so that instead of that, you have that kind of a trajectory? That's sort of the background, if you will. Now, ultimately, this has been called dementia care. Uh, it did start in memory clinics. Hopkins and many other places have put this together, have large memory care centers where we take care of uh, patients. And from the conceptual point of view, there are common patterns. They're all interdisciplinary. In our particular case, we involve neurologists, psychiatrists, geriatricians, nurses, psychologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists. The second common theme is that everything we do is personalized. 
We involve medical management. We put a lot of energy in taking care of caregivers, and we improve access to research protocols. And therefore, the specific activities of what we do is here, and these come from what we learned in Cache County. It's critical to impact comorbidities, manage heart disease, blood pressure, blood pressure at the right level, uh, manage colds, dehydration, constipation, the kinds of things that frail older people develop. It's critical to reduce the amount of medicines that patients are. We try to minimize or avoid the use of anesthesia, especially uh, general anesthesia. We judiciously use medications for cognitive or behavioral symptoms, but we spend a lot of time supporting patients and caregivers. That's probably the essential piece. There was a question asked earlier on about enriching environments and activities, and that's a big part of what we do. So we have operationalized this in a system called Maximizing Independence at Home or Mind at Home. Mind at Home was uh, conceived by Roy Hofberger, a major Baltimore philanthropist who raised a number of funds to get us going many years back to develop the Mind at Home project. Mind at Home is about knowing the kinds of needs that people have with dementia that influence the course of their illness. Surveying in a given patient who's living at home at a given point in time what needs they have that are not met and putting together a systematic protocol for that person to meet their needs to reevaluate that protocol over time. And this is ultimately spearheaded by this new workforce that we're developing who are care coordinators who we choose largely based on attitude and compatibility with working with mostly the older people who we take care of as opposed to being experienced or skilled clinicians. They so become under our training and as they work with our patients. So what are the outcomes? Well, the kinds of things that matter to patients are, can I stay at home as long as possible? So at the median, we can delay uh, leaving home to nursing home by almost 10 months. Uh, that is uh, very impactful from day-to-day -day life's point of view, but also very impactful from the cost point of view. We can improve life quality. Very few studies in dementia have actually shown that you can make life quality better. Most of them show that an intervention might change the trajectory of life quality, but not necessarily make it better. Importantly, from the point of view of caregivers, we can change the amount of time per week that they have to spend in taking care of the person they look after. And the delta, the difference at one year, is on the order of 16 hours per week difference, which is, if you think about it, a lot of hours of less caregiving. And this translates as well to a reduction in the burden that caregivers experience. So Mind at Home is very much in uh, its expansion phases right now. We have several projects ongoing trying to refine it working to introduce technology in its application. Why should we be having to go into the home all the time to monitor when we, for example, could use technology to provide activities to interact with patients uh, and caregivers? And we're hoping that while we're waiting for the cure that hopefully will come sooner than later and be real, that there's a whole lot that we can do at this point to take care of the 100 million people who are going to be develop dementia in the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Thank you. Very inspiring, Costas. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Sally Squires, freelance. Um, I'm interested in how many people are participating in Mind at Home right now and how this fellow got interested in doing the work, Hofberger. So uh, I can't tell you the count today. Over time, we've touched about 1,200 patients and family members, largely in the Baltimore, Washington area. Uh, Roy Hofberger, uh, I think, started in this because of his early career as a philanthropist. He was the chair of the board of what was at the time Baltimore City Hospitals, and also of a nursing home that had been started called Levendale. So he was always interested in making sure that older people get better care. And he realized in 2002 that he wanted that to happen in the community. Kevin Soden, uh, we, we know that uh, Medicare pays horribly for geriatricians and uh, uh, also pays very poorly for a lot of services. H how do you pay for 
for this service and do you think insurers will, you know, because of the benefit, you know, have, have an impact? One of the projects that Mind at Home has been engaged in is funded by CMS through an innovations grant, which is precisely attempting to estimate the cost savings that believe will accrue. And then we believe that Medicare will uh, hopefully evolve and shift from uh, fee-for-service payments for individual physicians, clinicians, to bundle payments that relate to managing a disease over a chronic period. Uh, that's how I think it's going to happen. And uh, the savings will probably come from Medicaid. So part of what's going to have to happen is a crosstalk so that when Medicaid accrues savings, that Medicare can pay a little bit more uh, to offset that. That's a big dream for the future, but I think that's how it'll get paid. Thank you. Um, Margaret Crane, Freelance. Uh, also, the role of community health workers that you alluded to, that would seem to be part of the mix, just to that would lower costs. I wonder if um, the models taken from developing countries with l poor resources, restricted resources, and the way they've managed to use community health workers to deliver care, um, I wonder whether we can learn from them or whether we already have. Thank you. So it's a complicated answer. As I pointed out to you, developing countries are going to face the greatest burden of dementia care. Uh, but they haven't yet because their population isn't quite aged. So most of what has been learned has been coming from our sister English-speaking nations, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and to a great extent, France. Uh, it is a community care worker-based model, as, as you correctly point out. Thank you, Costas. Thanks, Steve.